Hello, everybody. I'm Henry Adams from Colorado State University. And today I wanted to give an introduction to the mapper algorithm in topological data analysis. The mapper algorithm was introduced in the paper Topological Methods for the Analysis of High Dimensional Data Sets and 3D Object Recognition back in 2007, I believe, uh, written by Gurjeet Singh, Gunnar Carlson, and Fakunda Mamoling. When I describe the mapper algorithm to people, I typically describe it as a way of approximating a Reeb graph. So let me begin by describing what Reeb graphs are, and then I'll uh, tell you what the mapper algorithm, how the mapper al algorithm compares. Okay, so Reeb graphs. Let F be a, um, well, let M be a topological space. It could be a manifold, you know, like a, a smooth uh, torus, but it doesn't need to be. And let F be a real valued function defined on M. So F takes any point in, in our space M and spits out a real number. So I can draw F, um, F is a map to the real line. In this example, my function F is just the height along this torus, and that'll be my uh, function for all of these examples. But then at the end, I'll describe functions F that arise more naturally in data contexts. M in this picture is the surface of a donut, so it's called a, a torus. All right, so those are the inputs that you need in order to define a Reeb graph. You need a space and a real valued function on that space. So how do you get the Reeb graph? You do the following. At each real number, you can look at the pre-image under F. So you, you ask, what, what are all the points in my space M whose value under F is that specific real number? For that point, uh, red point, that's a real number, its pre-image is a circle. The Reeb graph is gonna encode the number of connected components in each pre-image. The circle's connected, so there's one connected component as I've drawn on the right. Now imagine um, raising your height, raising that real number. As I raise that real number, for a while, I still just have one connected component, but eventually, say for example, this height, I'll find that the pre-image is two circles. I have two connected components. I remain at two connected components for a while in the pre-image until eventually I get back again to a, a single connected component in the pre-image, okay? And then finally, you know, once my real number is high enough, I guess the pre-image is the empty set. I had no connected components. All along, I should have been drawing these connected components here. I have two connected components for a while and then back down to one connected component. So he here, I've chosen just a finite number of height values, but the Reeb graph considers all possible height values. And the Reeb graph tracks the number of connected components as the height changes. So the Reeb graph is really this um, continuous graph that I'll draw on the right here with no, dis no discretization involved. And the Reeb graph encodes the number of connected components as the height of this function changes. You can also draw the Reeb graph um, in this picture on the right over here. I could try to draw the Reeb graph on this side as well. So you'll notice that the Reeb graph encodes some but not all of the topological features or holes in our space M. You know, the torus has in some sense two holes. It has the blue hole going around one way and then the green hole going around the other. This Reeb graph here encodes only the blue hole, but not the green hole. And that's dependent on which filtering function, which function F you choose. 
So you can think of a read graph as measuring some of the holes of your space, namely those holes that are seen by your real valued function f, but you don't necessarily recover all of the holes in your space. Okay, read graphs are a quite common object in both mathematics and uh, computer science, in particular uh, computer graphics. Uh, folks compute read graphs quite a bit. Now let me describe the mapper algorithm. So the inputs to mapper are slightly different. Instead of a space M, we're gonna let X be a data set. And we'll similarly have a real valued function defined on X. So in this picture on the bottom left, X, our data set, is just this you know, finite sample of maybe 100 points. Those points might have been sampled from a space like a torus, but you don't know that they were perhaps sampled from that torus drawn in gray. And now my real valued function f is only defined on each data point. It's not defined on necessarily on every point in the torus or every point in 3D. Here for this example, my real valued function will be the height of each data point again. If I try naively to recover the read graph of this finite data set, I look at a real, real uh, number and I take its pre-image and I find that its pre-image is empty because with probability zero, will any data point have that exact um, height that I've chosen in red? So instead of taking the pre-images of, of particular points, in the mapper algorithm, you instead take pre-images of intervals. So the pre-image of this red interval is all of the data points whose height is in the, uh, the range specified by the red interval. I'm trying to quickly draw them all right here. Okay, now don't take the connected components of the, of the red data points. Instead, employ a clustering algorithm to try to cluster these data points together and see how many clusters you have. So here, most clustering algorithms would give a single cluster for those red points. All right, let's slide this interval upwards and consider a green interval here. Okay, so its pre-image consists of all these points that I'm drawing in green. So all the data points with height in this range. Okay, and if I cluster the green points, well, you know, I probably still get one cluster. However, by the time I get to this blue interval, now when I look at the points in the pre-image and I cluster, I'm gonna get two connected components from my clustering algorithm. Okay, so all these points are in the blue interval. I cluster and I get two connected components, one on the left and one on the right. Let's do an orange interval. Maybe again, this orange in interval, it's pre-image, really has data points coming from two different connected components after I cluster, cluster, one on the left and one on the right. And then maybe the last one, we'll raise the interval again and consider this purple, purple interval. Okay. And look at the points in the pre-image. And when I cluster those purple points, I probably get one connected component. So you can see that the mapper output is starting to look a little bit like the read graph, but I haven't defined the, the vertical edges, the connectivity. So let me explain how that works. It's important that these intervals overlap a little bit. So my green and red interval should have some overlap. And what that means is I have data points that are colored both green and red. Because I have data points that are both green and red, I add an edge in this mapper output between the green cluster and the red cluster. Okay, the, the green and the blue interval overlap a little bit, and that means I have some data points that are both green and blue. 
the data points that are in both the green cluster and the blue cluster on the right, they give presence to this edge between the, the green vertex and the blue vertex on the right. And the data points that are in both the green cluster and the blue cluster on the left, they give rise to this edge between the green vertex and the blue vertex on the left. The orange and blue intervals overlap a little bit. And I have some points that are orange and blue on the right and some points that are both orange and blue on the left. You know, a, a data point on, can be colored multiple different colors. Because I have blue points on the right that are also orange points on the right, that gives me the existence of this edge between the blue and orange vertex on the right. And because I have blue points on the left, which are also orange vertices on the left, that witnesses this edge between the blue vertex on the left and the orange vertex on the left. None of the blue points in the left blue cluster are also orange points from the right orange cluster. And that's why I don't have this edge from the left blue vertex to the right orange vertex. Similarly, none of the blue data points from the right cluster are also orange data points from the left cluster. And that's why I don't have this edge from the blue right vertex to the left orange vertex. Okay, so I've described for you how the, we decide whether or not to include an edge in our mapper output. And lastly, as you can guess, there's some overlap between the orange interval and the purple interval, which means I likely, um, well, in this case, I have data points that are colored both um, orange and purple. And the orange points on the left that are also colored purple give rise to that edge. And the orange data points on the right that are also purple give rise to that edge. Okay, indeed, this mapper output approximates the read graph in some sense, okay? And that's exactly the sense in which mapper is approximating the read graph, except as input, you don't have the, the beautiful space M, you only have a subsample X thereof. Notice that it is quite important to choose these overlapping intervals here. If your intervals don't overlap, the algorithm's not gonna work very well. You get to choose the intervals and how big they should be and how much they should overlap. And um, you know, different choices will give slightly different uh, mapper constructions. Folks have studied the convergence properties of mapper. So as you sample more and more points in your data set, there are various notions under which the mapper output indeed converges to the read graph. Wonderful. Let me move on to another slightly more complicated example. We'll just um, draw the read graph and the mapper output. So our space M is once again a torus, but it's a little bit more of a wiggly torus. So the height function here is more interesting. When I do um, the read graph, there are various times where the number of connected components change. So let's map those out. This orange, this uh, gray line is when I go from zero to one connected component. And then I'm gonna go from one to two connected components. And then I'll go from two to three connected components. From three back down to two. And then from two back down to one connected component. At this time, I have a splitting, so I'll go back to two connected components. One will end, so I'll be back down to one connected component. And then that last connected component will disappear. So the read graph, which I'll draw in red, will look as follows. I have no connected components before the bottom gray line, but then I have one connected component that splits into two. At this next gray line, a third connected component is born. And then these two continue. And then, <clears throat> let's see, let me draw that again. And then these two connected components merge by the next gray line. By the next gray line, these connected components merge. 
I have a single connected component for a while, but it splits back into two. The connected component on the left ends, and the connected component on the right continues until finally it ends at well, ends as well. All right. So what would the mapper output look like? Let me draw some intervals. So maybe I have a red interval. How, how about we only do red and blue intervals? So I have a red interval, another one, another one, another one, and another one. And then the blue intervals I'll draw as such. Okay. Let's do one more blue. So look at the pre-image of the bottom red interval. That's probably a single connected component. Look at the pre-image of the next highest blue interval. That's also probably a single connected component because I have, you know, these points that are blue. What's the pre-image of the next red interval? Um, that's gonna be two connected components, it looks like. One on the left side of the hole and one on the right. The pre-image of the next blue connected component, um, the next blue interval looks like, it again, two connected components, one on the left, one on the right. Okay, the next red interval, its pre-image looks like three. Uh, no, probably this guy and this guy. I have a new connected component and a merging event. Pre-image of the next blue looks like it's a single connected component. The pre-image of the next red interval um, looks like it's still a single connected component. Pre-image of the next blue interval is probably two. And then pre-image of the next red, I think it only contains the part on the right. And the pre-image of the next blue, if I cluster, it's probably a single connected component. All right. And then I have points in common with many of these um, data points producing a mapper output that looks roughly like this. This mapper graph is a good approximation to the Reeb graph. If I had fewer intervals, you know, I might have lost some of the features. Um, but here I've, I've recovered essentially every feature um, in the Reeb graph. You know, they all also appear in the mapper output. All right, so we've done two nice examples. For both of these examples, the function that we had was a height function, just so we could see it. In data um, applications, you typically need to choose what you want your real valued function f to be. Sometimes you have a nice real valued function coming from the specific domain in which your data lives. So maybe this is a chemical data set and each data point is a different configuration of your molecule and each molecule configuration has an associated energy with it. So maybe energy could be your filtering function F or maybe uh, your data points are samples of points on the earth which each have a temperature associated with them or a pressure associated with them. You know, or maybe each data point is an image or a part of an image and there's an associated intensity or brightness with each data point, okay? So sometimes you'll have filtering functions coming naturally from your data and you might even have multiple possible real valued functions that, that are naturally inherent to your data and you can look at multiple different filtering functions to get different views of your data sets which might measure different features or holes in your data. In other contexts, your data might really be point cloud data and there's no natural function coming from your data. Still, even then, there might be things, you know, just having a point cloud data set alone, you can just define interesting functions. These include things like a density or an eccentricity. So density might mean you have a density estimate at each point. Is it a central point or far away from other points? So you might approximate density by um, putting Gaussians over each data point, and then your density approximation is given by the sum of Gaussians. Eccentricity 
is sort of a notion of are you on a flare or part of the central core of your data? The eccentricity is defined as maybe the sum of all squared distances from your specific data point to every other data point in your set. Um, you can also use functions coming from graph Laplacians. So maybe you uh, build a graph on top of your data set and then you uh, compute uh, the graph Laplacian and look at its eigen, eigen functions. And those eigen functions can give you um, natural choices of, of uh, uh, functions on your data set. So my recommendation is that if your data set has natural domain specific filtering functions that it is equipped with, try out those. But um, and whether your data it comes equipped with nice functions or not, you can always use these general choices below, density, eccentricity, graph Laplacians, et cetera. And you should have the perspective that you should try multiple filtering functions and different filtering functions will give you different views of your data. Well, thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this introduction. And uh, please check out this very nice paper for more details. Thanks.